Good morning, Josh. Good morning, Richard. How are you? I'm doing well, thanks. How are you doing? I'm doing well. Yeah, happy uh, happy Thursday. Thursdays are great days. <laughs> <laughs> I uh, it's been an interesting one for me. I've got three younger brothers. I, I'm graduated from Kansas. I moved back to Houston. And my entire family, my lady's entire family, everybody is here in Houston. And so, I mean, Houston's big. You can get to wow. anyone, though, in about an hour 15. Mm -hmm. And over the weekend, my youngest brother uh, decided he wanted to move out to Steamboat. And so he packed up. He made the decision on Wednesday, packed up his car. He left on Friday. Uh, he'll be listening to this. So, wow. Cam, I, ho I hope all is well uh, out in Steamboat in the mountains. But uh, Don't skiing? Yeah, it's been yeah, he's uh he's actually working on the resort. And so right now, summer months, he's like they have like concrete sleds and all that stuff that they're able to do. Um, but yeah, come winter time, he'll be doing the yeah. ski classes and stuff. I grew up out west skiing in the mountains. Nice. It's nothing uh, like it. <laughs> Houstonian, I mean, it is a black box to us. I'm like, what what are you getting yourself into? But yeah. uh yeah, it sounds like he's having a good time. It's been it's been a fun few days though, for sure. <laughs> Fun few days. Um, I've got just, I mean, loads of cool stuff that I wanted to talk about. Uh, if you had just nothing super pressing, man, I'd like to get the ball rolling. Oh, go for it. Let me, let me share my screen. I mean, we kind of always start the same way, but I do think I want to, I'm going to start in a, a different direction this time. Uh, I mean, the world is full of chaos. And during these crazy times, I felt like this is a pretty cool change of pace. This is uh, two days ago the James Webb Space Telescope released its first few photos. I'm sure you've seen these circulating on different social media platforms, but these things are sweet. Uh, I mean, we've seen like Hubble telescope type photos, which blow my mind. I mean, I've got a whole tattoo on my left leg. It's my entire left, my entire <laughs> left leg is solar system. So I really wow. geek out on this stuff. Uh, but I wanted to show you a couple photos. I mean, this is a star forming region. This is nothing finance. So I'll blow through this. Yeah. But there's some cool photos. This was the one I was going to just point at and say this. Uh, so this is thousands of galaxies. That is the size of a grain of sand. Like this telescope is zoomed in thousands of galaxies. The question, if I have a question at the back of this, does, uh, does Richard believe in aliens? No. I don't. Um, and, uh, but what I, you know, when I see these images, I'm just in awe. And, um, you know, what troubles me, Josh, is that somehow people think that science um, is something that's like, okay, we got that figured out now. You know, we can, we can put it on the shelf. Right. But when you see this stuff and you realize where we live, you know, I mean, it just gets you on your knees. Mm. I think it should get us on our knees, actually, oh. you know, and um, and instead we just have it just sort of creates this arrogance, you know, like that. Oh, you know, look at us humans. We can put a space you know, telescope in space. Mm. I don't know. So um, I, uh, those images just, you know, they, they, they make everything else pale in significance. Ew. You know, you feel kind of silly talking about markets <laughs> when you uh, witness something like that. And I just would encourage everyone to let it, you know, soak it in and, and uh, not, you know, think that, oh, science knows this now, you know. So I don't have to think about it anymore. It's, it's just, yeah. it's beyond comprehension that we are in this universe that we can see, you know, that level of granularity that that is a grain of sand at an arm's length expanding out into countless galaxies. We have no idea what's going on, Josh. No idea, you know? <laughs> <laughs> yeah, ju just during your little spiel here, it yeah. gives me chill bumps. But I, I, like you, I look at these photos and I'm like, how, how insignificant am I? Like, what, how, what, what a drop in the bucket am I? And yet, how significant too? You know, 100%. that you can witness that, right? Mm -hmm. That function in us that can witness something like that and be in awe. That is, that's not insignificant. 
Mm. You know, so I get it, the whole massive universe, pebble of sand, insignificance, but we can't let that insignificance um, diminish the absolute awesomeness of it and the awesomeness of being able to witness it. Mm. Right. So I, you know, I, um, it's a, it's a profound mystery. We don't understand. We don't know if we're significant or insignificant. Really. We don't. Yeah. So, um, so, you know, don't put any labels on it, man. Just soak it it. in and and let it create wisdom, you know, instead of trying to reach a conclusion because there's really no conclusions Mm. we can reach other than to be in awe and to and to love it right to love it right like when we go oh i'm so insignificant it doesn't create love Mm. right i mean if you look at that you look at the universe you should love it totally you should love it and uh yeah so anyway that's what i get from it powerful man what one of the one of the coolest classes i took and it was a total blow off class my senior year was this astronomy course that Mm -hmm. I did and uh towards the back half of it they brought out this thousands of dollar telescope and we were able to look at different figures and the moon and stuff and stuff like that I I can't get enough of it it's uh it's super cool I could spend the full 30 45 minutes here but um (laughs) I'll zoom back over to to why 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 we pulled together this this old team um, every two weeks, I try to do a, a temperature check with you. I, I'm catching you at a, what I feel is like at a unique time. Just two days ago, you had the financial cycle summit. I mean, that's the, that's the squad that we want to hear from in times like this. So mm-hmm. for the folks that uh, weren't registered, didn't get a piece of that, haven't gotten into YouTube, I believe there's little clips and pieces of that there. Uh, I'm just curious, anything you have to get off your chest, uh, temperature check of just where we're at, man? I will uh, let me show you what I think is the most important slide that I shared yesterday. And uh, I got onto this from my friend Ben Hunt over at Epsilon Theory, who was looking at Total net worth in the US, okay, you know, how much money do we have in the bank, households and nonprofits divided by the uh, gross domestic product, right? So how much the economy produces each um, uh, each year, okay? So this goes back to the 1940s. And we see here, you know, from the 1940s up through 1998, you know, 50 years, our net worth divided by the productivity of the economy, you know, the gross domestic product was in a range of maybe three and a half to four, okay? So meanwhile, then since 1998, 99, okay, our net worth has shot up, but the economy has not become more, uh, you know, much larger, right? Mm -hmm. So the ratio, you know, so now, Our net worth is over six times as big as our annual gross domestic product. Okay, so where did all that wealth come from, right? What happened? Our economy didn't get that much bigger, right? Our wealth outgrew our economy. So where did it come from? You know, is it coming from other uh, countries? Are we like bringing money in from other countries? and other people outside the United States, you know, maybe a little bit. Is it coming from productivity and efficiency and innovation? No, <laughs> productivity has been going down, right? So I think this whole period from 1998 to today is the result of uh, like central bank intervention. Mm-hmm. And I'd call it a false wealth effect that has come from lower and lower interest rates and, you know, leverage and financial engineering. And it, you know, I mean, we're printing money and, uh, and it's not real wealth. And inflation is out of control now hit 9%, you know, and that's just what they're telling us about. Right. And every number in that report that came out yesterday, the CPI, was bad news. There was no good news in that report period. Yeah. So 
this is a terrifying situation. You know, what this means is that, you know, we could lose 33% of our wealth. I'm talking stock market wealth, bond wealth, real estate wealth, everything, right? <laughs> Just fall by a third. And that would get us back down to the, the high, you know, just to about four, right? And that's if our economy keeps going up, okay? So um, I think we're in la-la land here, you know? And uh, this chart, thank you, Ben Hunt, again, um, to me says uh, we're in for a world of hurt you know, to get back to normal. Now, I could be missing something here, but this feels right to me, you know, and even if it's only, you know, 15 or 20% correction, uh, you know, of everything, right? That wealth effect coming out of that, out of the economy, that deleveraging, right? Because we've been leveraging up for 25 years. Look what's going on in the crypto space. Celsius just, you know, bankrupt. Three hours capital folded. Voyager bankrupt. You know, this is leverage. They were all using leverage. They had no, you know, regulators. People just were like, oh my God, Tom Brady and Matt Damon say I got to get in, you know, and LeBron James. <laughs> Who else should I listen to? You know, LeBron, Matt, and Tom all say I should be in and Giselle. Holy smokes, you know, and, and they just, these companies couldn't pile on enough leverage, right? Mm. It's insane, absolutely insane. It is not wealth, it's leverage. And we are deleveraging now. And, uh, and that deleveraging is going to continue on for the foreseeable future. So it's a scary this chart place could be, to be. It's a scary this chart could be scary, be. man. I it mean, is if, scary. If, if, it's yeah. a very scary chart. It's a very scary chart. I pulled something of my own, actually. If I could steal this screen share from you. Um, I couldn't ask you that question and not have my own little graphic to show you. So shout out to Charter, who, I mean, they do some awesome graphics. Mm -hmm. um, but I thought this headline following on, I mean, to, to your point here of where this could go. Uh, this is the worst start that we've seen in the stocks, U.S. stock market in more than 50 years. Um, a weird stat that I saw in this article. I mean, I think this does this does the, the the news you brought there justice alone but an interesting piece here is of the 23 times the stock has fallen in the first half of the year that we track and that we're tracking here it has risen 12 times so there's like a 50 50 shot <laughs> of the you know sometimes when the stocks go down like this 50 percent of the time they rise in the back half of the year 50 percent of the time they fall uh, yeah. I think given a lot of the data you've consumed and a lot of the things that we've talked about, I think where we, I think where we, we know where we're anticipating yeah. well, this. Added. And this, and it's, it's worse than this really, because it's the worst year, the worst six months of the year ever when you combine stocks and bonds. Mm. Okay. So normally, you know, not normally, but when stocks are going down, bonds either are going up or they're not going down as much, right? But both stocks and bonds are down dramatically in the first half of the year. That has never happened before in the history of, you know, record keeping on Wall Street. So uh, this is the worst six months of the year ever for financial assets. So um, look, there's a lot of smart people, uh, buying and getting ready for a rally sometime over the next you know few months and i wouldn't be surprised to see a massive counter trend rally i think it will be a counter trend rally though i don't think we're done with this you know cycle of pain um and uh Richard, I'm, I'm sorry to interrupt. What, what, what's a, what's a counter trend? A counter trend rally means, you know, we're in a bear market, but there's going to be a massive bull rally. Um, and, you know, maybe that will be uh, the end of the bear market. I don't think so though, mm. but you know, like I've been saying for a while, we don't live in free markets anymore. We live in fed markets. And if the Fed decides that they're going to start easing, you know, and the market buys into that, they're like, okay, we've inflicted enough pain. Let's start 
let's start easing now and the market's like, okay, let's rally, you know, and let's get the new highs. That's not going to solve our problems. You know, that's going to be more of the same financial engineering that sooner or later we're going to have to pay for. And if they keep, you know, kicking the can down the road, which look, that wouldn't be a surprise to see them do that. Right. Mm -hmm. But uh, we can't, um, you know, we know better that that's not really a solution. That's just kicking the can down the road. So, um, so it's tough. These are tough, tough markets right now. I don't want anybody to think otherwise, you know, to think there's some silver bullet. What's interesting though, you know, when another of the presenters, Jake Bernstein yesterday was showing how, you know, the, the, the commercial, um, I don't want to get too technical here, but let's just say, you know, institutions are buying the stock market. Insiders are buying their own stock, right? And meanwhile, um, the, the little guy is extremely pessimistic right now, right? And, um, you know, what that tells me, what, what it affirms to me, Josh, right, is that these, these insiders and institutions, they understand risk management, okay? They know how to position themselves, you know, for three months, six months, 12 months, okay? And to be able to survive, even if things go against them for a while. Whereas the average retail investor, right? You, you know, your markets were at highs back in November, right? And then they're down 10% and you're like, oh, I'm gonna add some to that, you know, cause this is a dip, right? And then they're down another 10% from there and you're like, ah, oh, I'm gonna add some more, right? And, uh, and then they're down another 10% and you're like, oh, I'm gonna add some more. And now you're tapped out. You know, you don't have any more to add. And, and, and when it goes down the next 10%, you're gonna start puking, mm. right? And you're gonna have to capitulate because you are now in danger of, you know, really impairing your future if it goes down any further, right? Yeah. So this is what people need to understand. This is what it means, you know, to be a strong hand in the market. It doesn't mean you have a lot of money. You know, it means that you can endure, you can survive you know, um, and you can position yourself for, you know, what will ultimately be um, a cycle change, right? <laughs> you know, it might take a year though. Um, and uh, that's, you know, that's having your head on straight in the markets. And that's where we got to get to, you know, it's a time to survive, not a time to be a hero. I think you're pulling at many strings in that example you just gave of yeah. like you know uh there are many first time investors or folks that oh. are you know newer to the market that saw this dip and are hearing this is at a discount get in oh it's at a discount yeah. even more get in and now they're you know the powder they had that dry powder is gone we're continuing to see this 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 Think and, of the people at celsius and you know voyager whose their assets are frozen totally you know, not to mention falling, mm. right? Frozen and you can't get it out. Yeah. While it's falling. If you ever will get it out, who knows what's going to happen in the bankruptcy proceeding. So that's, uh, you, you can't buy that dip, you know? <laughs> uh, speaking of buying a dip, there is, this has got to be one of the more interesting. Let me correct stories. that. You can't buy that dip and expect that you're going to be made whole in a month, right? If you have dry powder, you know, and you want to buy the dip right now and you're okay holding for three to five years, smart. But there is a buying the dip is and hoping for, you know, a V bounce, you know, and being the hero. No, it's not going to happen. Uh, there's a different type of dip. Uh, that I, was, I wanted to show you. This has got to be one of the more interesting stories. Um, speaking of buying a dip, maybe this is something any of you uh, black hatters out there maybe may be interested in. Um, I, this is from last week. I don't know if you've heard this, but no. uh, a hacker, this is, scroll down a little bit for you. Um, Bitcoin story for you. It's been a few weeks since we've talked anything crypto, but last week, a hacker, it's known as China Dan, 
breached the Shanghai police station and accessed more than a billion Chinese citizen records. Mm. Uh, I mean, a billion, it's, a billion records is, is it's so much, 23 terabytes of data and uh, turned around last week and offered to, you know, a buyer, he would sell that for 10 Bitcoin, which is $200,000. I, uh, I, I work in the cybersecurity space. This is, uh, I mean, f- there, there are two things. One, super inexpensive data. I'll take that cap off. Uh, the second thing is like, I often ask myself like, what in the hell are we doing? Like, how, how, how is this even possible? And what is going on in this chaotic world that we're able to still, you know, steal billions of records and sell them for 10 Bitcoin. And there's just, uh, man, uh, while we're dealing with all this real, real world chaos, there's stuff like this going on. And, uh, now we're just, we're, we're battling interesting times. I don't even think I have a question here. Maybe, maybe I do. Uh, any comments on this? I mean, did you, did you, you have any, did you see this? I didn't see this, but uh, I interviewed Brad Rotter, who's on the board of the Foundation for the Study of Cycles yesterday. Brad has um, been at the uh, center of multiple, you know, events in financial history including the beginning of financial futures, the beginning of hedge funds, the beginning of cryptocurrency. Um, He's a big uh, um, student. He's a military guy, went to West Point, you know, and he's a big student of of, uh, cyber warfare. Mm. You know, he's talking about cyber war as having very unique characteristics of war, right? For one, there's no victory. There's no end. You don't like, you know, capture the flag or capture land or take your opponent's general. <laughs> mm. Like there is, there's no end. Yeah. And uh, so I, it is a whole new world, man. And uh, it's, it's kind of scary and you just don't know what's going on, you know? And I think we do have to, begin to assume and understand our digital lives as, as being a kind of warfare. Mm. You know, it is, it's constant warfare. And that's the way I see it. You know, that's what I've been talking about for a while. That's why I'm developing the tools that I am. I see them as self-defense, like digital self-defense against like volatility, manipulation, right? Because, you know, like, what's going on in markets right now, right? Whether it is um, like a conspiracy and it's perpetrated, right? By let's say a group of insiders who are like, yeah, let's run the markets down now, you know, the central banks, I don't know, you know, who am I, right? No idea. The bottom line is this repeats over and over again, right? And the, the small investor is always a victim of it, right? Because, you know, we're unprepared. We don't understand how it works. We don't have the tools that professionals have to defend ourselves against these market events, Mm -hmm. you know, which happen with regularity. And uh, and so, yeah, uh, you know, that stealing a billion records, selling them for 10 Bitcoin. uh, Brad and I talked about all that yesterday. And um, it is a, yeah, I just, I think we have to understand our digital and financial lives as a kind of warfare. Mm. It's interesting. I, um, it's not the way most people look at it, you know? It's I, like, I think hey, it's let me get online. Let me play a game. Let me, you know, no, it's war. Yeah. And it's an endless war. And you have hundreds of adversaries, you know, whether it be governments or central banks or organized crime or, you know, Robin Hood, you know, legal crime. Uh, that's the world we live in. Mm. It's uh, an interesting perspective. You're, you're firing some things off. I mean, I, I think you're spot on. I, I, I've been in the, the cybersecurity space. This is more than seven years now. And I've watched businesses do this against other businesses and other yeah. individuals from other countries. And I, I, I think that we have slowly seen that cyber warfare world 
migrate and make its way into the consumer, the individual. And surveillance you know, capitalism. Hundred percent. Yeah, v- visuals uh, and and protecting just you know your own data, protecting credit card stuff, protecting uh, cryptocurrency information. I mean, all these different exposures. I, I think I think you're spot on, and it's not going to get any any simpler as we take One of over. The things more Brad control. said yesterday, he said, "I used to say that the most valuable data in the world was in the Pentagon, but I don't say that anymore because it's been hacked and sold, and the most. And now I say the most valuable data in the world." are um, uh, Bitcoin keys. Mm. And if you have them, people are coming after them, right? So your private keys for any Bitcoin that you own, right? And then, I mean, in that little article sort of reinforces Brad, Brad's point. Data on a million, billion Chinese people or 10 Bitcoin, Jimmy <laughs> 10 Bitcoin, you know? <laughs> Lord have um, mercy. I want to I want to just snack on that one 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 question. You know, we've over since since you and I have gotten together, we talk about cryptocurrencies and specifically Bitcoin. We we've hit it, you know, 30, 40 percent of the time. Like we 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 brush up against it pretty mm-hmm. frequently. Mm-hmm. Uh, <clears throat> here recently, we've seen some pretty nasty, chaotic stuff in that world and businesses doing some funky things. Um, I think even the the asset class itself has gotten a little shaky and, and there's questions around that. I, I, I wanted to just maybe pose the, the question of, it, you know, are you still a believer? And with this significant drop, 2014, Bitcoin saw a 70% drop from its previous high. It recovered. 2018, it saw an 80% drop from its high and it recovered. Uh, both times, fully recovered and then eventually hit a new all-time high. Are we just in another one of those drops, uh, or is this is this different? You know, do you, are you still a believer in the in the asset class? I am still a believer in the asset class. I am skeptical that we're going to recover. You know, the Bitcoin is going to hit a hundred thousand dollars anytime soon. Mm-hmm. Um, mostly because I just don't see um, people using it in a way that is creating value, right? Another one of the things Brad said yesterday is, you know, if you were gonna use Bitcoin to buy a latte at Starbucks, right now you have to think about it in terms of a capital gains event, Mm. right? Like, are my capital gains, if I, you know, exchange this Bitcoin for a latte, are my capital gains on my Bitcoin going to, you know, be cost more than the cost of the latte, right? So as long as you have to think like that, nobody's ever gonna use it just yeah. as, an, as a medium of exchange, right? So, um, you know, I when I look around, Josh, I still um, find most compelling in terms of actual usability, the, um, the ESV Bitcoin, so which is done by Craig Wright, who, as Brad said, you know, people are less, uh, people are more neutral about Donald Trump than they are about Craig Wright. <laughs> <laughs> um, he's a controversial figure, but you know, the the um, transaction costs are super low. It's not caught up in this kind of Ponzi scheme, you know, economics. And it's actually producing um, applications that are uh, scaling mm. and that the transactions costs aren't crazy. So in that regard, you know, I'm skeptical that BTC, Bitcoin and Ethereum has, you know, the two 800 pound gorillas can achieve scale that would, you know, create, allow for the value exchange and value creation that would justify, you know, the valuations of those currencies. So I'm skeptical. I'm not giving up. I own some BTC. I own some Ethereum. Um, And uh, I still believe in the vision. Um, And I am hopeful, actually, that out of this uh, 
hopefully creative destruction <laughs> we're going through right now. Um, you know, that uh, the uh, phoenix, you know, will rise from the ashes. But I don't think the ashes are done, you know, accumulating. And I just think what happened over the last few years was insane and uh, not real value creation. Yeah. Uh, I'm, I'm looking at my time. Give me one or, or maybe two more questions. Um, sure. This is one I, I had submitted. Um, and, and I mean, this is via Twitter and email. I even, I saw it a few times in our app, but um, I want to share this with you. Um, over the last six or seven months, I think since the beginning of the year, uh, we started the year January, Euro was a dollar 13 compared to the US dollar. Uh, it's dollar 13. Mm -hmm. um, today, we, I'll actually flip over here, are at dollar for dollar. The Euro is equivalent to one US dollar. Click on that max link over there above the chart on the right. Let's, let's see know. that. You know, look, it was a dollar 50 back in 2008, dollar 55. And now it's a dollar. Exactly. Um, and that's my question is what the hell does this mean? Right. I, I saw lots of this on Twitter, people screenshotting and saying, Oh, it doesn't watch mean out. a whole lot to you, you know, and me, right. Cause we're in dollars. Um, it means you can take a good vacation in Europe. <laughs> if you want to go to Europe, now's the time. Uh, you know, what it means is that uh, there's more concern about what's going on in Europe. Right. I mean, Germany is, uh, I mean, they're having a, they got, they got big problems over in Europe right now. You know, they got a land war in Europe. <laughs> they got huge energy crisis going on, right? Um, they are not protected by the Atlantic Ocean and the Pacific Ocean <laughs> like the United States is, right? With relatively friendly, you know, uh, neighbors to the North and South, Canada and Mexico. So, um, you know, the United States is in a unique geopolitical position um so in unique geographical position and in times of stress and crisis you know the united states is the safety play and uh so what it means is you know more money's going into the u.s dollar i mean i was just looking at the dollar before we got on this call and it was break it was soaring it's breaking out again mm. it's over a dollar nine now i mean it, it's on an absolute tear so, and every, what it means is that everything that's priced in dollars, right, um, is, uh, is the underlying value of the asset is the same, but it's getting more expensive, okay? So, um, you know, and, but for you and me, uh, you know, we're already all in dollars. So, um, it's, it's. It's not as big a story <laughs> as you might think, you know, if you're a multinational corporation or you're, you know, you're, for some reason your business is, you know, getting, uh, earning euros instead of dollars or your paychecks getting paid in euros instead of dollars, you're in trouble, yeah. you know, but, uh, but if you're all in dollars anyways, um, mostly it means take a vacation in Europe. Mm. I had, I had some two or three more cool questions. I'll plant a couple of them to the next one. Um, what, one more for you, if you, if you have the time, mm -hmm. I'm, I'm going to punt. Uh, I, I, there's such a cool graphic here that I'll bring up in the next call that talks about the inflation. You can actually go through and do some of the tracking. I'll bring this mm -hmm. up in the next slide. This is where I want to end. And I feel like it's just a, all the chaos and everything we're talking about. And it just seems I'm, I'm trying to pull up some other things that we can there's emotional levers that I'm trying to pull here and mm -hmm. I crossed paths with this study. And I thought, I thought this was a good change of pace. Um, you know, a lot of the folks that tune in know I run a podcast on the side roads to wealth and, and it mm -hmm. just struck a chord. I've had a couple of folks, uh, Brian Portnoy and Dr. Brad Klontz that hint at this. Let me give you a little mm -hmm. bit of background on the study, but um, this study, they went through 33 different countries. Um, they talked to 220 ish folks and across that, they asked a couple questions, but one of my favorites was how much money would it take to satisfy all of your desires? And, you know, this, they went in there with this hypothesis, the assumption, like 
everyone is asking for an infinite amount of money. The first sentence here, humans have unlimited wants. Mm -hmm. And that's, that was a hypothesis of this, but as they went through and asked this question, they found across the board, the, the answer for the 38 year old person is that they asked for between 1 million and $10 million total. Uh, $1 million at 38 years old is $25,000 a year, which is not, not that much money. My, my, my question, I think, is, you know, Dr. Brad Klontz, Brian Portnoy, they talk about how people have these, these money scripts, these psychology, this, the psychology of money and how funky it is. And people have this, you know, one idea, they think one way, they act another. And I want to ask this question, maybe this exact question of how much money is enough money. And I've, you know, me chasing financial independence, this fire status, I've always gone off the 4% rule. And you've got to like accumulate this huge lump sum. And then you have this 4% drawdown. You'll never out, you know, you're never going to outpace that. And so you'll have enough to retire off of, which I think in a time like this is obviously not the case. I wanted to pose a question here and see if you had any feedback on maybe the, the study itself, which I know you haven't read and I'll send to you. Um, but maybe just a little bit about the, the psychology of money or, or how, how much is enough. Yeah. Um, really interesting. Uh, I'm just reading the first, you know, bold paragraph there. And uh, like the last sentence, the result, the results suggest that transformative approaches relying on limiting wealth and growth to achieve sustainability may be more consistent with human ideals and mm. aspirations than commonly believed. Um, you know, the assumption that humans have unlimited wants and need unlimited resources to be happy strikes me as uh, very convenient for a consumption-based economy, mm. right? And I don't think it's true, you know, I mean, and the study seems to suggest also that it's not true. And I think it's more of this kind of peddling of the kind of, um, you know, being constantly dissatisfied and constantly needing more. It's like a mythology that's driving our economy and that I think is leading us to very destructive places and I don't think it's what most people believe, mm. you know? So where is this coming from, right? Where is this message coming from that, oh, you just gotta get and get and get and get and get and get and get, you know, and you gotta get a big pile and, and that's the only thing that matters, <laughs> you know? No, <laughs> there's so many other things that matter. And uh, so, yeah, we don't need, you know, a huge pile. We don't, you know, that, that whole myth is, um, uh, it's very destructive and it's very convenient. Um, you know, if you're trying to keep a, a global consumption economy going. <laughs> so I, uh, right on. I, I, I won't make my, this story long, but you are reminding me of my, um, you know, my, my stepmother, when I was in high school, then going through college had this terminal illness that she was battling and mm. she's still, still kicking today, still, I mean, fighting hard. And I had a conversation with her recently about the podcast and this idea of like building wealth and, and all this stuff. And she's mm -hmm. like, you're traveling all the time and you work late at night and this and that. And she's like, you know, I, I have success at the win of the day. If I can get in the backyard and garden. She's like, you have success if you close a big deal or if you do this, yeah. who's richer? And I think that's a very, I think it's a, that's a powerful question. It's something that you know, we, we could be thinking about, especially at this time. She's right. Mm. That's what I got for you this week, brother. Uh, this, no. this was a fun that's one. That's what uh, she's got for us. <laughs> yeah, that's exactly right. Uh, good change of pace. I, I appreciate you, you being flexible and willing to chat through some of the stuff with me. Yeah, always a pleasure, Josh. Great to talk with you. Have a great week. You too. Cheers. Bye.